I am grateful for this opportunity to address a favorite subject of mine, historical architecture. In this case, historical architecture of Marshall and of Harrison County. Architecture, like any art, uh, music, painting, literature, any art is a reflection of life, of the people and of the period and the place in which they lived. Historical architecture is our most tangible link with the past, and Marshall and Harrison County is an absolute treasure trove of historical architecture. The first architectural style in Texas was the Spanish missions. Some 25 Spanish missions were built uh, in Texas. That's more than even in California, which had 22. And uh, ever since then, we have had a lot of Spanish revival. There's an excellent Spanish revival home in a neighborhood just a couple of blocks east of the of the hospital this particular home notice has the walls and the archways it has um, tile stucco and you notice the little bell tower right there is indeed a bell hung there and the Spanish revival uh, is still with us in some ways that that original architectural style of Texas now Harrison County was and Marshall were settled in the 1840s and uh, uh, the settlers built log cabins. These were single pin log cabins or double pin, uh, which were which were uh, a, a double pin log cabin was uh, was a two room. This is, was originally a single pin, a one room log cabin built on Trammell's Trace, which was an important transportation route in those earliest days. You'll notice a little porch in front. And you'll notice also that rooms were added, plank rooms, to either side. But this started out as a one-room log cabin. Um, this advanced into something else. Let me notice the, the upper uh, diagram is that of a double log cabin. Very frequently as the kids would come along, well, they would build uh, a second pen and you'd have a double log cabin and you, you wouldn't build it, the rooms adjacent to each other. There was a little bit of a space in there and that was called a dog run or dog trot because dogs would chase each other through that breezeway, if you will. And the double the double log cabin had its uses. The the room the the roof covered the entire complex, and so so that dog trot was a shaded area where the woman could uh, work on her tasks, sewing, shelling peas, or whatever, and the men could work on certain things too. Or you could just sit there and enjoy the breeze. And uh, the dominant feature of this type of architecture architecture was the front porch, the gallery, which is why I tried to point out the uh, porch on this on this single pin log cabin that we just looked at. Uh, the uh, porch was the dominant feature of that house and it would continue to be. It was not called a porch until well after the Civil War. They were called galleries. But this, this, is, the, this is the genesis of the Greek Revival architecture of the antebellum period. If a farmer did well with a couple of crops in a row, he might add on to his house, perhaps add a couple of rooms, and these would be plank rooms, and he would plank over the, uh, the first two rooms. Or, of course, he might just build such a house uh, from, uh, from scratch. And uh, in this case, you'll notice that uh, two fireplaces would serve the entire four rooms, or in some cases, the, the, the rooms up above. If this was a two-story house, the floor plan would be exactly the same. The central hallway, which would be just as wide, often as much as uh, anywhere from 15 to 20 feet wide, it would be just as wide as that old dog trot. It would be enclosed, but the doors were double doors, and they could be opened, both of them opened at the same time, and you would get that breezeway effect. Very important in those days, because you'll notice that there are interior doors opening onto the hall. There are also interior doors even on other sides of the fireplace. You 
have uh, two, room, uh, two windows per wall. And those two windows um, were tall windows as much as possible. Uh, they, might, they, were, they were actually figured by the figured and described by the number of window panes. The lower sash might be, might have six window panes and the upper sash would have six. And that would almost be the, uh, the height of the wall. Now the, the standard height of a ceiling today in our houses where we're trying to uh, conserve heat in the winter or air conditioning in the summer, the standard height is eight feet. And the standard height of these buildings was about 12 feet. That way you had a full six feet above you, even if you were, if you were a six foot person. And the air could circulate above your head. You had a, a, a little tool which you could reach up and pull the upper sash down about halfway while you reached down and uh, raise the lower sash that had cooler air coming in and warm air circulating above your head and circulating on out but sometimes even out of a transom above the doors and that was the plan and they would have on the gallery of that time they would have um, a handsome uh, porch with columns, ah, those columns, the Greek Revival columns, that was the whole idea of Greek Revival. The balance, the stately columns, and these predictable floor plans, there's something cultural about that. That reflected the stability of, of, of the society in which there was, um, you know, a pretty strong class alignment. Now, notice this. This is, you can see how the porch or gallery dominates the architecture of that house, dominates the front of this house. This house was built in the 1840s. Um, it's about two blocks west of the courthouse in Marshall. And it has two rooms left and two rooms right. But it has another interesting feature. Harrison County, of course, borders uh, Louisiana. And so many Louisianans moved in here and they brought various things with them, cooking, music, and architectural style. Notice this diagram. And below, you will notice that the, uh, the standard uh, Texas um, porch roof alignment was separate from the roof of the house, but not under, under the Louisiana scheme. You drive around in Louisiana, see a lot of old homes, and you'll see that the porch is incorporated in the roof line of the entire house. I live in Carthage now, and there's a classic building that was one of the oldest buildings built in Carthage, and this, this roof line is quite visible, and thus it is with this particular building. Building, again, west of the courthouse. It's classic Greek revival, the, the predictable floor plan, the columns, and of course, you know, in this case, the Louisiana roof line. The um, Marshall was also fortunate, in fact, is in, in that it was the only, um, it was the only, um, town in Texas that had an out-of-state rail connection. There were some short-line railroads that um, were kind of a network out of Galveston, our major port, but they did not go very far into the countryside. In the case of Marshall, however, there was a railroad in the 1850s that went all the way to Captain Shreveport. And Captain Shreveport uh, connected, of course, with the Red River, angled southeast all the way down to um, to the to the uh, all the way down the Red River to the Mississippi River and thence to New Orleans, which was the premier city of the South. And thus, we had not only the Louisiana connection expressed architecturally with that roof line I mentioned, but also we had uh, a New Orleans connection. New Orleans has a very high water table and thus they have to build their houses, if they're smart, up off the ground somewhat. And that, that is called the raised cottage style. In this uh, handsome building, which is called Magnolia Hall now, built right after the Civil War, 
uh, you'll notice that the steps go up to the main floor, which looks like a second floor. And indeed, in the rear, there are two masonry buildings. One of them was utilized as a kitchen in the old days. But you walk in that house and it is two rooms left, two rooms right. It is that identical uh, floor plan that we've been talking about. No closets in these houses for <laughs> some interesting reasons, but, but they had a large closet up under the roof, the ceiling. And when you go into Magnolia Hall, or at least when you used to go into it, as I did a couple of times uh, some years back, there was a stairway that looked like it led to a large uh, second floor. Well, it didn't. It led up to the ceiling. And then, and then under the ceiling, which is where all manner of things were stored, the winter clothes, the furniture that was unused, there was also a little way to get up on top of the roof. That roof between the chimneys is flat. And um, it surely had a, a, a balustrade around it. And there was therefore what was called a widow's walk. The widow's walk, uh, that term was, uh, was utilized uh, oh, by, the, by the sea captains in New England. They liked to go up when they were not at sea and they liked to go up there and watch the ships come in and of their competitors and so forth. But uh, if the guy went on a whaling journey or something and didn't come back and word came that that ship had been lost, his widow would go up to the top of their house and look out with a telescope scope, hoping against hope to see her husband's ship come sailing in, and thus the term widow's walk. In the case of plantation houses in cotton farming country, this would be called, uh, uh, this would be utilized by the plantation owner to come out and check the fields out this way and that way from that elevated uh, area. And thus Magnolia Hall, a uh, wonderful example of, uh, of not only antebellum architecture, not only of the Greek revival house, but of the raised cottage style from that New Orleans connection that we have. Notice this much larger version of that. You still got the uh, central hallway, two rooms left, two rooms right. You've got a full story downstairs, but those are secondary rooms, principally bedrooms originally. Up Upstairs are the major rooms, the dining room, the parlors, and so forth. And um, this, uh, this is a larger version of the raised cottage style and a very handsome example of this. Here's the Taylor home built in the 1840s, the first brick home I've always been led to understand built in uh, Harrison County. Indeed, there was a kiln, a brick kiln uh, behind this place, and uh, the bricks were made there, and this house was built in the 1840s, some pure Greek revival, except in one way. It's only one room deep. You have a central hallway, one room left, one room right. However, it's not just a four-room house. This two-story house is eight rooms because the L wing, and that was common in particular because they'd put a kitchen back there, and uh, you, you, did, you wanted your kitchen separate from the house for a couple of reasons. They kept a the fire going all day long, and it's warm in East Texas, and so consequently you want, uh, uh, you want the kitchen separate because uh, no microwaves in those days. They had to uh, cook all day long to put three meals on a table. And that heated up the house a great deal, particularly in warm weather. Also, since there's a fire all the time, the, the kitchen might catch on fire and the L wing often was detached except perhaps for a room uh, for a roof and uh, and therefore uh, if you if you lost your kitchen well you just built another kitchen on the foundation in the case of this particular home the L wing consists of two rooms downstairs and two rooms right above it it is an eight wing uh, extension and uh, all there are all kinds of famous ghost stories about that L wing and so forth and a couple of kind of racy stories that I heard at one time that I won't repeat here. But in, in, in any event, that was the uh, that was a, a very famous historically, architecturally it's important, but historically too, because the lady who would become known as Lady Bird Johnson, uh, Lady Bird was born in this uh, historical house. And then we have a nice single story 
home built in the 1840s uh, just east of downtown. Uh, here, this is pure antebellum. Again, notice the porch dominates the front. Two rooms left, two rooms right. And if you can see on the right side, the L wing extends in that particular direction. Uh, here, here is one that was built well before the Civil War. And it is a two-story house. Again, as you can see, two rooms left, two rooms right. And uh, the whole house is served by uh, two, two chimneys. And you will notice an L wing, and you can see a little bit of an L wing in the back. You'll also notice something else. This house has stood there for a long, long time. And so consequently, and during the Victorian period, carpenters came in and added a few Victorian touches with their uh, jigsaws, with their band saws, a little bit of gingerbread. And uh, here is another such house. Again, two rooms left, two rooms right. And so you, you see the idea, you see one of these houses and you know what the floor plan is. Again, a reflection of the stability of the class life of that area. Now these buildings, uh, this, this style of architecture, Greek revival was used in churches and in public buildings. Now here is the first substantial courthouse built uh, in, uh, in Marshall. There, when uh, uh, pioneer counties in Texas generally had a log county cabin for a, uh, their first courthouse. But particularly after, after we became a state in 1846, now the, Me the war with Mexico followed and um, Texans turned in damage reports, claims to the government, to the federal government. We're a state now. We're not a republic anymore. And we needed, we needed damages for uh, combat that took place perhaps on your, on your spread down in South Texas. Or we needed uh, we needed damages from Comanche raids, and these damages kept being turned in. And by the seven, by the uh, 1850s, they amounted to 17 million dollars—an awful lot of money in that particular decade. Now, Texas was the fastest-growing state in the Union in the 1850s. Census of 1850, our first census, we had 212,000 citizens in Texas, and um, 10 years later, in the census of 1860, just before the Civil War, we had over 600. Thousand, our population tripled in a decade. Well, that growing state, boy oh boy, you couldn't get by with log cabin courthouses. And so consequently, we started to have these brick courthouses built. And notice the lines of this little Virginia, which was built in uh, 1848. You, you, you can see, you can see the, uh, the entrance, you know, reminiscent of the, of the Greek temple. You can see the balance in this building. And um, this, this one was, again, one of the early brick ones, 1848. But throughout the 1850s, county after county after county got their first brick courthouses. Then Marshall prospered during the Victorian period and ultimately in the 1880s built this magnificent pile. It, it was um, it was a very much a Victorian house. It's nicknamed Little Virginia too. But you can see the Victorian lines in this ornate old building. These kinds of courthouses. Texas has 254 counties and uh, most of them have these wonderful ornate counties or had them. This one burned but fortunately Marshall uh, rebuilt right away. It, be, it burned in 1899, I believe, and by 1901, the building I'm standing in right now was completed. And uh, it, uh, it too had the Victorian touches. So the Victorian era was not yet over. And so here is this splendid example of what is called courthouse gothic. Marshall had two courthouse gothic uh, buildings, one of them built in 89 and then the other one built a little over a decade later. And uh, very, very uh, fortunate in that way that one of them at least still stands. There's something else that stands, it stands atop this building, atop the dome. And it is the goddess of justice. The goddess of justice was uh, almost requisite for these, these courthouses. The goddess of justice would be standing there blindfolded and she would have the scales of justice in one hand and the sword of justice in another hand. And uh, you had the goddess of justice above almost every courthouse in the state of Texas. Now those church buildings on the right is the First Methodist Church. 
this building, certainly a wonderful example of Greek revival. Now it's been it's been added to and changed a lot, but this building. Uh, is, is certainly the embodiment of Greek revival architecture. Just You can just see the temple look in the original version of it. I had some students who knew, well, I used to give something along the lines of these programs to, the, to, to, to my classes. And uh, so students who were acquainted with, uh, well acquainted with the uh, youth minister, I guess he was at the First Methodist Church, he was interested in this kind of thing too. And so I was invited to go up there after class one day and I shucked my coat and tie and went up there and crawled around with him upstairs in the much larger building today and he was able to show me where where and when this was added and this segment was added and so forth. Now bear in mind that was built in I believe 61 right before the Civil War. Just a little over a decade later the Presbyterians began to build something but in the, by the 1870s the Victorian style of architecture was becoming popular and you can see on the left the Victorian touches in this Presbyterian church which still stands today and that is the whole idea of what I'm doing here. Historical architecture is our most important link with the past. Well we have a lot of these fine buildings have been torn down but not these. You can see how many examples uh, that, that still stand here and that is, um, that is an example of uh, Victorian church architecture in the early Victorian period. Now, um, transportation, there was, um, there was a state, there is, in fact the building still stands, a stagecoach in building uh, just a few miles to the north of Marshall. And uh, it has been added to particularly in the rear. You can see that it was built, built by someone who had that uh, Louisiana connection. Notice the roof line incorporates the, uh, the porch. And this was then a stagecoach in. Stagecoaches would stop, their passengers would get a meal, and then on to Marshall, or perhaps they were headed north somewhere, or perhaps they would need to stay overnight. And so those were the, the inn, the stagecoach inn, provided meals and overnight accommodations. And then later on, here in Marshall, for goodness sake, the Capitol Hotel, which when I moved here, I moved to Harrison County in 1969 as the head coach. Uh, of the Wascom Wildcats. And that Kay Woolens building was a department store, but of course previously had, it had been the famous Capitol Hotel, which was built in 1857. And then behind it stood another historic piece of hostelry, and that was the Hotel Marshall, the multi-storied, a classic example of downtown hotel. And fortunately it's still there. The, the old Capitol Hotel has been torn down, but the Hotel Marshall is still standing and in use as a property of East Texas Baptist. And then, of course, there is the, uh, the, 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 the depot. My goodness, that's the old Texas and Pacific depot. By, uh, by the Victorian period, Marshall had been appointed a division headquarters, had a huge rail yard. And, um, and uh, this was at a time when railroads were the most important industry in the entire United States. This is before the 20th century auto industry. And there was there were all kinds of jobs associated with the railroads and all kinds of traffic passing through town. There was a lunch stand on this side of the tracks, a little old plank lug, uh, uh, a little old uh, frame lunch stand called Ganocchio's, and um, it became famous as a site of a shootout that included the wounding of, a, it was the killing of one guy and the wounding of a famous actor named Barrymore, great great grandfather of uh, Drew Barrymore, I believe, and um, and so the gentleman that owned this thing invested in a hotel, and that hotel now the Ganocchio lunch stand was right out here where we are in this parking lot that you can see, but the hotel behind was a handsome building, very ornate. And uh, it stood across the tracks from the depot and was the obvious place for people to uh, 
uh, you know, to, to get out and eat, find place, and stay. And Mr. Ganacchio in the 1880s had already built himself a fine Victorian house, dominated, as you can see by the turret, but as you can also see, uh, an important uh, Victorian feature, you cannot predict what that what that uh, floor plan is you know boy those days were over with it was a new age and so consequently he had the, he had a house dominated by sort of uh, you know an almost required turret in fact a really good Victorian mansion had two turrets but anyway we had one here and he had a tunnel built underneath the street from his house to um, to the uh, to the hotel so that he would not have to carry the money out of the hotel to his house every every night uh, on the street. He could do it underneath. That uh, tunnel has been blocked now. I had students who once upon a time uh, used, used that thing <laughs> in a slumber party and told me all about it. And then of the, thus the railroad was the most important form of transportation, the most important um, uh, business you could have in your town. Now, um, one of the railroad officials hired a bunch of railroad carpenters to build himself a house in the 1880s. And you will notice it's kind of an interesting transitional building. I've been in this house when it was kind of wide open <laughs> because people had just quit using it. And so I prowled around in it and it has the, the old um, Greek Revival floor plan, two rooms left, two rooms right. But you will notice Victorian features, uh, some stuff with the windows. You've got a turret, half a turret. You can see over on the left, this was the Haggerty home. And again, it was a transitional thing and it was built by a railroad official and he hired railroad carpenters to do it. Very interesting tr transition. Now notice this really fine Victorian home here and you can see how it is dominated uh, by the turret. These houses, these fine Victorian houses all across the eastern third of Texas were quote quote built by cotton. Uh, people who uh, had made a fortune in, in cotton lands, maybe putting them out on their cotton plantations if you will. But in uh, West Texas, increasingly during this era, they were, quote, quote, built by cattle, often in town, but sometimes out on the ranch. And then in Southeast Texas, they were in, in the Beaumont and Orange area. They were built by timber, built by lumber uh, down there, that being the dominant uh, industry. And all over the place, in towns such as Marshall, that were growing because of ambitious businessmen. They were built by businessmen. And that was then, and notice the wonderful features of these things. The tower, of course, notice this is a side view. Notice the, uh, the Victorian touches, the, the, the gingerbread and so forth. And notice this little side porch here. And notice another feature of this, a gazebo in, a, in another place. Gazebos were very important yard architecture. And here is the rear of a nice two-story Victorian house. And you will notice that they have with a, one of the latest uh, conveniences out on their back porch, they have a well. You did not have to go out into the yard for well water on a rainy day. You could do it right there on the porch. And here is another interesting feature in that same neighborhood in the eastern part of Marshall. You have a um, you have a very you got all kinds of nice gingerbread and jigsaws and all of that with this thing. But you will notice that there is a porch right there dominated by gingerbread work that has no way to get up on it. There are no stairs up to it. There's no door. You, know, you just have to crawl out from under the window. And a lot of these two-story and even three-story Victorian houses have these things way up some porch that you can't really get out on. That was that was a part of the whole of the whole uh, makeup of, of the Victorian building. The Victorian era in America was a time of explosive growth and change. Society was in upheaval after the Civil War, while industrialization and urbanization added to the turmoil. But the unregulated economy, there were very low taxes, 
and almost no regulations. And that produced vast wealth along with a sense of power, progress, optimism. This was a romantic period as well as some of these features I just showed you indicate. All of these qualities then were expressed in Victorian architecture. The stability of pre-war, civil war, of pre-civil war society had been reflected by these Greek revival homes with uh, stately columns and balanced, predictable floor plans. But after the civil war, with slavery ended and with countless opportunities beckoning uh, in the cities and the new cities of the nation successful individuals turned to a new style of architecture in their houses and in their churches as well as in their commercial structures and public buildings the dominant feature again would be the turret but the expansiveness the exuberance the individualism and I, I must tell you the vitality of the late 19th century found architectural expression in a multiplicity of Victorian styles. There was the Queen Anne style, which is quite prevalent in and around Marshall. The General Grant style, the Second Empire style, Gothic Revival, Richardsonian Romanesque, a heavy um, style with arches that I, I, I particularly like, Italianate also, shingle style, shingles on the walls instead of, instead of boards. Um, the uh, mansardic style and, and in fact mansard roofs still are among us at Dairy Queens and at, uh, at convenience stores the style of roof of this is mansardic uh, there is carpenter gothic there is the gingerbread style uh, a personal incident uh, incidents the, you see the carpenters had just gotten the jigsaw the bandsaw they were thus able to um, whack out with their newfangled saws the gingerbread designs my grandfather O'Neill was born in Georgia in 1868 he was the son of a cotton farmer he um, by the time he was a teenager he was working in his uncle's lumber yard and uh, uh, that was in Louisiana, by the way, and there he learned the carpenter's trade. Then, restlessly, he moved on into Texas, still a teenager. Before long, he moved to Navarre County, met my grandmother. She was the daughter of a cotton farmer, and he became a cotton farmer for life as well. But he also used his carpenter's training. And yes, he built houses, and when he built residences, he built them using that bandsaw and adding the Victorian touches. He also, however, was a gin right. And um, I should have thought to include a cotton gin. I, I recall a fine one in Jonesville and so forth, because cotton gins, where you had a cotton gin, where there was enough cotton farming to justify a cotton gin, then you would also have a general store or two. You would also have a church or two. You certainly had a school and a collection of houses. You'd have a community if you had a cotton gin. And I showed, I, I, I just showed, I just suggested 10 different styles. Well, they like to mix these styles. And when you took a feature of this style and added a feature of that style and bastardized another style, they began to call that kind of place Bastardian. Victorian residences express the owner's individuality and their prosperity. Again, shunning Greek revival conformity, Victorian houses bristled with turrets and bay windows and gingerbread decorations. Some of these features I've just shown. Again, the ornateness of the romance of the period. As many different materials as possible were used. Different kinds of woods, different kinds of stone and timber, inside and outside. Tiles, shingles, and... Um, Let's see what else we have uh, here. Again, you just see these wonderful things. Again, these are all houses that still stand, you know, a tangible link with the past. Look at that gingerbread work above the entrance way. And notice, though, how the, the, this one's not dominated by a tower, but transitionally still by the porch. Um, here is one of the finest uh, remnants of... Um, of Victorian architecture and residential architecture in town and it is utilized as I understand it as a B&B &B today I know it has been done uh, for a number of years 
Uh, here is an interesting feature. There will be a full program on the Star Home. But what is interesting to me about this, this is a view of the rear and of the cistern, the rain cistern that, uh, that was built in the back, a very large cistern. My uh, grandparents long lived in a little old cotton town that did not have, little old farming town that did not have, they had three cotton gins, but they did not have running water. And so every house, including the modest four-room house that my grandparents lived in, had a round tin cistern. That's the only way you could get running water in your house, and that's the way the Star Home uh, got there. It's very impressive, I think. And... Um, Let's see other features. Here is a commercial, a late Victorian commercial building, but it's been restored, the Elks Lodge, and it is just a couple of blocks uh, north of the courthouse where I am right now. And other features, one unique here, this is the Hockwald home. Um, Ike Hockwald was a prosperous businessman and he was an enthusiastic sportsman and he headed up the professional baseball team in Marshall in the heyday of minor league baseball and he even was president of the East Texas League. But he also had an automobile and you see his driveway on the right, here's a better shot of it, and he would drive his car down toward the uh, toward the garage and he would stop it and he would be on an automobile turntable and that is a rare and unique uh, form of architecture he would then have his car turned around and back it into the to the garage or he could he could back out of the garage the next day use the turntable to turn around and head straight out of the driveway very very interesting uh, kind of a feature to me as the as the um, Victorian era faded, I mean, you know, you do something just X, however long it is, and then, then you want something else. It began to be phased out by less ornate, but no less sizable, a style called Prairie Gothic. And here are two really fine examples of Prairie Gothic. You'll notice they're very large buildings, but they don't have much left in the way of, of Victorian features. On the right is one that lots of people may be familiar with, the Weissman Home, built right at the turn of the century. He was a very prosperous businessman and community leader. Here's an interesting uh, building. When East Texas Baptist was formed, it's a little over 100 years old, and that was one of five buildings on the campus. Down the hill to the left was a cafeteria for the students and a, a little small dorm for some of the female students. Behind the college were the other two brick buildings, uh, two-story uh, brick dormitory for women on the left and for men on the right. And you're looking at the only classroom building. Now, it has much changed indoors now. It's been quite renovated. But um, there was a full gymnasium in the basement with a running track. There were classrooms and offices for the entire school on the, on the next two floors. And on the top floor, there was an auditorium. The back of the auditorium, the back of the stage was at the rear uh, of the building. And and, um, and so that was it. If you went to class at East Texas Baptist, well, that's where you that's where you went. Across town was a, a more historic uh, school. Uh, let's see. For this is the this is the first. This is the Carnegie Library of Marshall. Across town was Wiley College, and the president of Wiley um, took advantage of Mr. Carnegie's offer to put up matching funds for a library, and he um, was able to get this Carnegie Library built on the campus of his school. Many years later, it was turned into it was turned into um, uh, an administration building. But uh, historically, it was Marshall's only Carnegie Library, one of about 40 built in Texas. And there's one other thing I should mention to you, uh, since I am where I am and speaking under the auspices of the uh, Harrison County Museum. 
Um, there were, I remember when I first came to town, I used to enjoy going to, to the movies at the Palace Theater, big old ornate old fashioned movie theater. And, um, and there were numerous other movie theaters uh, in, down, in, in the downtown area, I'm told. Before that, there had been opera houses here. And um, these opera houses always had one or two balconies, as the movie theaters did. Reminiscent of all that, none of those are still around today, but reminiscent of, of all that is the, um, the um, Memorial City Hall Performance Center, which is across the street from where I'm standing now. And that performance center uh, has been has been restored beautifully. The front part of it is a is a fine fine extension of this museum, and then in the rear part, the old auditorium with I think around 500 seats uh, is still there. And part of that seating capacity is a double balcony. And if you ever want to get an architectural uh, recollection of what the old performance venues used to be, go in that some time and look up and you'll see these gorgeous old wraparound double balconies. It's a, it, this is a wonderful place. This is a rich place for these kind of resources. And uh, as I said at the start, I revel in the opportunity to try to talk about Marshall, Marshall's architectural link with the past.